Facebook Live. From Medina. At Ace Hardware. In the parking lot. Three weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's been a while. So, how are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. What, what you, you got a Bible study I there? I got a Bible yeah. study right there. Awesome. Yes. How have you been doing? What's um, your uh, social security number? I've been blessed. I keep that secret. I only tell my <laughs> wife that kind of stuff. I only, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we got a bit. You got a marriage certificate? Yes. Oh, you do. I do. Awesome. I'll, t I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. Anyways, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You're looking lovely as always. Well, you're looking very handsome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I see you're working hard today. Yeah, you too. Yes, yes, you yes. Too. Oh, my goodness. We got some people here. Mom's here. Hey, Mom. Hey. We haven't seen our mom in a while. Yeah, it's yes. been a little bit, almost a week, right? Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. something like that. Hey, Cindy, it's nice to see you. Hope you and your family are all doing well. We know Ed's coming, Felicia, Emily. We know David's coming, uh, Don's coming. Happy birthday, by the way, Don. Uh, Dolores, the whole, all the family of God is coming. So if we missed your name, we apologize. Mm -hmm. You're in our prayers every morning. So we thank y'all, we love y'all, and we got a Bible study for you today. You ready to pray? I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the showers of blessing that you bestow upon us. We know that we can come to you at any time, Lord, and ask for your spirit of truth to guide us in all truth. So that's what we do now, Lord. We ask that you would pour your spirit into us as a river, not just for us to receive, but for us to share. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can believe and trust and rely on you. And as we pray, we just ask that you speak through us and teach us about the knowledge of good and evil so that we can be equipped in our minds not to fall for any of Satan's deceptions. So thank you for speaking through us. Thank you for holding us in your hand. And thank you for giving us the privilege of asking things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so a knowledge of understanding the knowledge of good and evil. Hey, Paul Brown, nice to see you. Hey, Surendra, I appreciate all y'all taking the time to come study with us. This is, oh, this, the two trees is like part of who I am now. And uh, I think it's so important for us to understand this truth so that we can get through the coming end time deception. And thank you for the Bible, my beautiful wife. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says this, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. He that doesn't understand agape knows not God, for God is agape. So if we want to know the living true God, the Father, we got to understand agape in character and method and principles. Psalm chapter 18, verse 30 says that God is perfect. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. That means God's agape has to be perfect and unchangeable. Well, we always do our three core Bible study principles to cement these things in our mind so that we always instantly go right to them. So, three core Bible study principles. Uh, God is agape. Principle number one. Self-control. Considering others more important than you consider to yourself. Not getting personally offended when others uh, sin against us. This is agape. This is how God is. Perfect. Unchangeable. Second core Bible study principle. The life of Jesus is the ultimate revelation of the Father. John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Everything that Jesus did in character, method, and principle is exactly what the Father did if he was in Christ's place. Third Bible study principle is biblical principle explains scripture and scripture explains biblical principle. Isaiah 28, 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. The Bible explains itself. We don't need a pastor. We don't need books. We we need the spirit of truth to guide us in all truth. And today we're going to talk about understanding the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2, 16. Genesis chapter 2, 16. Understanding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord... And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 2, we see God warning Adam and Eve not to participate in consuming the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when they did, they would die. 
This was not a threat. God wasn't saying that in the day you eat thereof, I will kill you. God was giving them a warning. God was trying to protect them from Satan, from the knowledge of good and evil, which is sin and death. And this is an important aspect of this. We notice that God did not call the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He did not call it the tree of death. He could have because it was the tree of death. God calls it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he wants us to understand what makes death possible. Now, what I'm going to say is probably new because this understanding is not going out into the world. Character of God movement. This knowledge of good and evil needs to go out into the world. It's just as important as agape. It's just as important as design law. The knowledge of good and evil is a system of reward and punishment. It's be good to the good with rewards and blessings. It's be evil to the evil with punishment and curses. This is Satan's system. This is not God's system. We in Christianity have projected this onto God, but this is not God's system. The knowledge of good and evil is a reward and punishment system. The good in Satan's system, Satan's system, become self-righteous and earn the blessings of heaven and eternal life. The evil in Satan's system become condemned and earn the curses of heaven and eternal death. This is not God's system. This is Satan's system. The world has been deceived into thinking it's God's system. It's not his system. Satan's system of good and evil is very deceptive because it makes the good in this system think that they're good because of what they do. And it makes the evil in this system think that they're evil because of what they don't do. Right? Satan has deceived the whole world into thinking that the good in his system is the polar opposite of the evil in his system. But they're not opposite. These are two sides of the same coin. So when we think of the knowledge of good, we think that that's God's goodness. It's not. It's Satan's goodness. It's a counterfeit goodness because God's goodness is agape. Very important. Satan's goodness is selfishness. Very important. And the good in Satan's system and the evil in Satan's system, they're actually completely opposed to God's agape love. And the knowledge of good and evil actually removes God's agape love completely from the mind of man. And the natural consequence when that takes place, when you take away God's agape love from people, a system is created where you either deserve God's love or you don't deserve God's love. That's exactly how Christianity operates. So once the knowledge of good and evil, this reward and punishment system takes place, this removes God's love, which means it removes God's grace. And once you remove God's grace, then you actually end up creating a hierarchy system. Those who deserve God's love are at the top, and those who don't deserve God's love are at the bottom. We're gonna show this from scripture. But first, we want to ask, what is grace? This is very important, because grace is unearned, unmerited. You don't deserve it, right? It's unearned, unmerited love, favor, and blessings of God. And the Bible says that God's grace is for everybody. Matthew 5, 44. God's grace is for everybody, but Satan doesn't want you to think that. Satan wants you to think... Satan wants you to think you have to earn God's grace. Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Ephesians 4, 7. Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So God's blessings are for everybody, both the good and the evil. God's grace through Christ is for everybody. And the knowledge of good and evil removes this idea. And we begin to think that we have to earn God's love. We have to deserve it. It's not true. It's a lie of Satan. So the knowledge of good and evil removes God's grace and it creates a hierarchy. Well, what is a hierarchy? A hierarchy is a system or an organization in which people or groups are ranked 
one above another according to their status, authority, or what they do. And Romans chapter 2 verse 11 says that God has no hierarchy. Romans chapter 2 verse 11. For there is no respecter of persons with God. To God, we're all his children. He doesn't put us on different levels, elevating some and bringing some down. The hierarchy system that runs the world, that stems from the knowledge of good and evil. We're going to see why in a moment. So this satanic system of the knowledge of good and evil, it removes God's unconditional love and it replaces it with a hierarchy of privileges for those who can make it to the top and restrictions for those who are at the bottom. This system that Satan created, it creates pride in those at the top who look down on those at the bottom. And those at the bottom end up feeling like everyone else is just a stepping stone on their way to the top. And if you get in their way, they'll get you out of their way by any means necessary even if it means killing you this is the system that runs the world as i say this we see it all over the place schools jobs educational hollywood it, governments run on this system and it's satan's system of good and evil which creates competition pride worthlessness insecurity pain sorrow guilt fear covetousness, deception, corruption, greed, rage, malice, violence, and death. This is where it all comes from, the knowledge of good and evil. And in Satan's hierarchy of good and evil, people end up being forced into submission. Once we're forced into submission, what is created is a master-slave relationship. This all comes from the knowledge of good and evil. And it uses fraud, it uses cruelty, it uses deception. And it will murder in the name of good to do good things. That sounds crazy, but it will even do fraud, cruelty, deception, and murder in the name of God and will think that it's a good thing. You can't violate God's law. You can't violate agape in the name of God and call it good. You can't do that. In Satan's system, if certain conditions are met, you'll earn the privilege of being loved and blessed. In Satan's system, if you don't do certain things, you won't earn the privilege of being loved and blessed. It's very important that the knowledge of good and evil is completely opposed to God's agape love. And the moment you participate in Satan's system, the consequences that happen to you, to me, to everybody, is that we are, end up with the same defiled evil character that Satan has. And the Bible shows us this. So, in the Bible, there's three instances, there's three, king, there's three kings, there's three descriptions of Satan. Two out of three of these kings are pointed to the Garden of Eden. And it shows what happens to Satan's character through this system of the knowledge of good and evil. And the two trees in the garden, they represent two kingdoms, that's true, no doubt. They represent two leaders, that's true, no doubt. But they represent two principles that govern the mind. And this is very important because the knowledge of good and evil possesses the mind of those who live in Satan's kingdom. The same way that agape possesses the mind for those who live in the kingdom of God. Luke 17, 20. Luke 17, 20 says this. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within us because it's the principles of God's kingdom. It's God's agape love. You can't point to a place and say there's God's kingdom because God's kingdom resides in the mind. It's the principles that make life possible. It's the agape that exists in the mind. When that is inside of you, that means the kingdom of God is inside of you. It's the exact same principle 
when we talk about Satan's system. Satan's system of the knowledge of good and evil resides in the mind. That's where his kingdom is. And it's these principles that make life impossible. And so the three kings, right? We, we see uh, Pharaoh pointed back to the Garden of Eden. We see uh, the king of Tyre pointed back to the Garden of Eden. And we see the king of Babylon. These are three kings, but they're really three descriptions of Satan. And as we look at these descriptions, we're going to see how Satan's character was defiled through the knowledge of good and evil. And then it says that the same thing happens to us. It's very important. So, Pharaoh, a type of Satan. Ezekiel 31, 2. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Ezekiel 31, 2. Ezekiel chapter 31 verse 2 says the son of man speak unto Pharaoh king of Egypt and to his multitude whom art thou like in thy greatness now the power behind the kings of the earth is always Satan so here it's addressing Pharaoh but it's actually talking about Satan and we can see this in verse 8 it says the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him the fir trees notice this is talking about the garden of God and it says, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his bogs. The chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees in the garden, uh, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted thyself up in height, and he sh hath shot up his top among the thick bogs, and his heart is lifted up in the height. So Pharaoh is a type of Egypt. This is very important, and it's directly connected to the Garden of Eden. And the tree that exalted itself, we know that the tree that exalted itself in Eden was the knowledge of good and evil. So what can Pharaoh tell us about Satan? Look, look back at the Bible. Pharaoh questioned God's authority. And Pharaoh was a king who kept God's people in bondage. That's the typology that we're drawing from, right? And Pharaoh is connected to the Garden of Eden on purpose to give us symbolic imagery of Satan. Who questioned God's authority in Eden? Did God really say? That was Satan, right? Who took God's people in bondage in Eden? That was Satan, when he captured Adam and Eve by bewitching their minds inserting his principle they became slaves to sin who exalted the principles of the knowledge of good and evil in Eden that was Satan a second king the king of Babylon the king of confusion this is a type of Satan Isaiah 14 4 Isaiah 14 4 here we go Isaiah 14 4 Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, Hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. So again, the king of Babylon, the king of confusion, this is a type of Satan, and the typology is, is this. While the king of Babylon had God's people in bondage, he created a false system of worship. Very important. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Right? We see a throne an exalted throne above the stars of God. This symbolically represents Satan's government and Satan's law of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted to exalt these principles above the stars. And we see that when he did that, he took one third of the angels with him. And we see that as this is describing what happened through Satan's throne, or his law of the knowledge of good and evil, there's a self-centeredness that takes place. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. 
all of this happens to us when we participate in the same system. The King of Tyre is another king that displays satanic attributes. Ezekiel 28.2 Ezekiel 28.2 says this. Ezekiel 28.2 Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and because thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, I in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. It's exactly what Satan did in type. And we're going to notice another connection to the Garden of Eden. Exodus, or Ezekiel, chapter 28 verse 14 13 uh, Ezekiel 28 13 thou hast been in the garden in Eden in the garden of God every precious stone was your covering the sardis the topaz the diamond the barrel the onyx the jasper the sapphire the emerald the carbuncle and gold the workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created Thou art the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set thee so. Thou hast walked upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Before, therefore I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thine beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom with the reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee kings before, before thee that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I will bring a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So again, we see a king, the king of Tyre, a type of Satan, who s projected himself as God. And there's another connection to the Garden of Eden. And we see that in verse 15, that Satan is described in per as being perfect. And when the Bible talks about perfection, it's talking about agape. It's talking about relationship. And Satan's perfection in agape and relationship with God is tainted through the iniquity that was found in him. And it says that in verse 16, that Satan's merchandise filled him with violence. What was the merchandise of Satan? It was the idea that a system needed to be created where the good need to be rewarded with blessings and the evil needed to be punished with violence. Right? As soon as you develop the idea that people who are evil need to be punished, you go around looking for it and that begins to build violence in you and violence more and more. Verse 17 says that Satan lifted himself up, self-exaltation and corruption took place in his heart. And verse 18 says that Satan defiles his sanctuaries by the iniquity of his traffic. But what exactly is Satan trafficking? Or should we say this, what exactly is Satan selling? Right? He's selling the idea that the knowledge of good and evil is superior to God's agape love. Satan says, be good to the good with blessings, and be evil to the evil with punishment is superior than to God's grace and God's love for everybody. This idea defiled Satan and it filled him with violence because then he went around looking for people who were doing evil so that he could punish them. And the same exact thing happens to us, right? The same corruption, the same defilement that Satan went through because of the knowledge of good and evil is the same corruption and the same defilement that happens to us when we participate in the knowledge of good and evil. It's exactly what the Bible says. Ezekiel 28, 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquity. 
by the iniquity of thy traffic. So when we participate in this system, the same defilement and the same corruption happens to us. Very important that we are the temples of the God that we worship. We're the temples. Our minds are the storehouse of the principles of the God that we espouse to follow. If we follow a God of agape, those principles of agape will live in the temple of our mind. If we follow a God of good and evil, the principles of that God of good and evil will reside in the temple of our mind. Satan's sanctuary is everybody who lives by the principles of the knowledge of good and evil. That's just a reality and a fact. And it says that those people who use Satan's system are defiled in the mind because they use the system. And it's the exact same defilement that Satan went through is the exact same defilement that happens to us. Pharaoh is a type of Satan who in Eden questioned God's authority and took God's people into slavery. The king of Babylon is a type of Satan who confused God's people and took them into bondage and created a false system of worship. The king of Tyre is a type of Satan because he thinks he's God, who in Eden was selling an idea to God's people which corrupted them. You will be as gods yourself. Right? These three kings tell us what happened to Satan as he used the knowledge of good and evil. He exalted himself. He became self-centered. I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. He was defiled. He was filled with violence and iniquity. And it's all because of the system that he created, the system of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the system that he allowed to govern his mind which corrupted him, which defiled him, which filled him with iniquity. And the exact same thing happens to us when we participate in the knowledge of good and evil. We become self-centered. We become filled with violence. We become defiled and we end up making ourselves as God. It's predicted in the Bible. Everything that happened to Satan's character with the knowledge of good and evil is exactly the same thing that happens to our character when we use that system. And God actually predicted this in Genesis chapter 3. Right? We look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 9 through 19 and we see curses. They're not curses. They're consequences and what God does is he actually explains these consequences of the actions of Satan Adam and Eve and he he uses the curses or the consequences as a prophecy that's crazy but these are not curses they're consequences because they chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil let's go to Genesis chapter 3 right now let's read this we're gonna see curses but they're really consequences, and they're also prophecy. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9 says this, And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereas I commanded thee that thou shouldest not? And the man said, The woman whom thou gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now we begin to see curses, but they're actually prophecies. Genesis 3.14, The serpent is cursed. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. That's a prophecy. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put hostility between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is a prophecy. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. And the woman said, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That is a prophecy. Genesis 3.17, Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, 
and has eaten of the tree which I have commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy brow, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So, what we see in Genesis chapter 3 is curses. But was God punishing Adam and Eve with curses? Well, this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. It says, And he said unto Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree which I have commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. Right? The ground is cursed because of what Adam's choice was. It wasn't God punishing. Right? And what God begins to do is he begins to explain consequences of eating from the tree. But these consequences are actually prophecies. We see four prophecies. We see a prophecy about the Messiah, which we know, Genesis 3.15, is a prophecy about the Messiah. We see a prophecy about Satan. We see a prophecy prophecy about Adam and his descendants and we see a prophecy about Eve and her descendants God is not punishing Adam and Eve with curses he's simply explaining the consequences of their decisions by allowing Satan to have access to their mind God is allow God is explaining what he can no longer protect them from and the, each one of these is actually a prophecy that explains the defilement it explains the, the removal of grace. It explains the hierarchy system that is created. God hid nothing from us. And so God does all of this through prophecies. Prophecy number one, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? Uh, the woman's seed shall bruise your he uh, crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the Messiah defeats Satan. We know 100% that that's a prophecy. Prophecy number two. Genesis 3.14, Upon thy belly, dust shalt thou eat. This is a prophecy of Satan destroying humanity. That's important because up to this point, when Satan was in the garden and he was introducing the knowledge of good and evil to humanity, no one had ever died in existence. The first death didn't happen until Cain killed Abel. So up to this point, Satan didn't see how his system caused death. That's just a reality. If you look at the chronological order of things, it was by faith that we had to believe that Satan's system caused death. It didn't actually happen yet. And so that's why Satan said, oh, no one's going to die. No one's going to die. You can participate in my system. No one's going to die. It hadn't happened yet, right? So what we see is that the first Genesis 3.14 is a prophecy, upon thy belly dost shall eat. This is actually a prophecy how Satan destroys humanity, devastates them. And then we see another prophecy in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. This is the woman's curse. This is sorrow in childbirth. This is not pain, it's sorrow. And it's a desire for thy husband who has rule over you or dominion over you. Right? This is a prophecy as well. And then we have a fourth prophecy. Genesis 3, 17 to 19, the man's curse. Cursed is the ground with thorns and thistles. By the sweat of thy brow you will eat bread. Physical reality explaining spiritual truths. Very important. We know for a fact that Genesis 3, 15 is a prophecy about Messiah defeating Satan. Let's look at the curse of the serpent and let's see what that has to tell us. Genesis 3.14 And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all thy days of thy life. So we see a belly, and we see eating dust. And let's look at the belly. Psalm 44.25 Psalm 44.25 says this, for our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly cleaves to the earth. It's very important that the soul, the character, the life is bowed down. That means it can't stand upright, right? It's 
touching the earth. The belly is touching the earth. So this is a prophecy about Satan not living an upright life. It goes deeper than this. Job chapter 15, verse 35. I'm not getting crazy on you. Bible's going to explain this. Job 15, 35. They conceive mischief and bring forth vanity, and their belly prepares deceit. So the belly is a symbol for deceit, vanity, mischief. This is what God is saying Satan is going to do in the earth. Proverbs 18.8. Proverbs 18.8. Here we go. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8 says this. The words of a talebearer, the words of a liar, are as wounds. They go down into the innermost part of the belly. So what do we see? The symbolic understanding, spiritual understanding of the belly. That is lies, it's deceit, it's vanity, it's mischief. That's hurt, harm, or damage. And that's a life that is not upright. So as the serpent was to go on its belly and touch the earth, so too Satan's connection to the earth would be a, a, a connection of lies, deceit, and a life that is not upright. What does eating dust mean? Psalm 103, verse 13. Psalm 103, verse 13, Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knows that our frame, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. We are dust. We, humanity, is dust. And it says in the prophecy that the serpent will eat dust. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The curse of the serpent is a prophecy about Satan and his connection to the earth. Through the knowledge of good and evil, Satan would lie, deceive, live crookedly, and devour humanity very important that what God is doing us he's giving us an understanding of the consequences throughout human history of what would happen to humanity as they're governed by the knowledge of good and evil let's look at Adam's prophecy Genesis chapter 3 17 Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 says this and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt eat, not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. So, cursed is the ground with thorns and thistles. By the sweat of thy brow will you eat bread. This is a prophecy. Because there's always a physical reality that tells of a spiritual truth. What's the f spiritual truth of the ground? Luke chapter 8 verse 15. Luke chapter 8 verse 15 says this. But that on the good ground, so we're talking about ground now, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth with patience. So the ground is a symbol for man's heart. It's a symbol for man's mind. So in Genesis, the curse of Adam, when he said, cursed is the ground with thorns and thistles, God was telling Adam that the heart would become cursed corrupted with evil and wicked thoughts and oh Matthew chapter 13 verse 3 we see it exactly right here fulfilled Matthew 13 verse 3 says this and he spake many things unto them in parable saying behold a sower went forth to sow and when he had sowed 
Some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured it. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root and withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And others fell on good ground, and brought forth some hundred, some sixty, some thirty-fold. And so what we see here, in Matthew uh, 13, 3 to 8, we see the different conditions of the heart that have been devastated by the knowledge of good and evil. And we all know, Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is dis desperately wicked and deceitful above all things who can know it. Right? This is the consequence. This is the prophecy. Right? Because of Adam. Cursed is the heart of all humanity with wickedness. It wasn't just God, God's going to make labor for Adam hard and now he's going to have to work harder to eat food. That's not it. That because of Adam, the one who carried the seed of all humanity, that character would be transferred throughout all of humanity and that the heart of man, the mind of man, the ground of man would become thorny with thistles and hard to receive the word of God. This is what the Bible says, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, 26. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, A new heart, a new ground, also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Regardless of the curse of Adam and the, the, the stony ground, the thorny ground of man's heart that has wrecked havoc all through human history because of the knowledge of good and evil, God can fix us. He can heal us. He can change us and give us a new heart that isn't rejecting of God's word. So everything that Satan did, God is able to counteract and fix because he loves us, because he trusts us, because he values us. Now, there's another part of this prophecy that says, by the sweat of your brow. By the sweat of your brow. Because the knowledge of good and evil removes the love, the grace of God from the minds of men, now, by the sweat of your brow, you will then try to earn God's love. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Ho, oh, everyone that thirst come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money come buy, eat, yes, come buy wine, milk, without money and without price. Wherefore, why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Why labor? Why listen to the lies of Satan that says, by the sweat of your brow, you have to earn God's love? Why spend money on things that don't satisfy you? That's very important. Psalm 127, verse 1. Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. See, because we believe the lies of Satan and the knowledge of good and evil that says, be good to the good with blessings and be evil to the evil with punishment, we think that we have to work very hard to earn God's love. But it says that we labor in vain when that's our mindset. That's not how we, that's not what God wants. That's not what man was designed for, right? This is a curse. It's, it, it's a prophecy of man's heart becoming wicked because it believes that God doesn't love us. It believes God's grace is no longer available because of the sin we do. So that we end up working by the sweat of our brow to earn God's love. And this is what Jesus says about that. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew 11, verse 28 says this. 
come unto me, all ye that labor, all ye that labor in Satan's system trying to earn God's love, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John chapter 6 verse 33. The truth of God in the revelation of Jesus Christ sets us free from the lies of Satan that says we have to work by the sweat of our brow to earn God's love. John 6:35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. When we go to Jesus and receive the bread of life, we no longer have to work by the sweat of our brow trying to earn God's love because Satan's system of knowledge of good and evil is broken from our minds. Very important. The woman's prophecy. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. These are all prophecies about the effects of the knowledge of good and evil, the consequences, not just for Adam and Eve, but throughout the course of all human history. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 says this, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we see sorrow and labor, we see desire, we see dominion. Genesis chapter, or Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 15. Jeremiah 31, 15 says this. Thus saith the Lord, a voice heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they are killed. This is the sorrow that God is describing, not the physical, I'm, not, I'm a man, I never gave birth, I can't speak for women, but I can say this, that the slaughter of little children, which lasts in the mind of women for a lifetime, is more painful, and I'm not speaking for women, I'm just saying, this is the sorrow that God was talking about, Genesis 37, 25. Genesis thirty-seven twenty-five, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted their eyes and looked. Genesis thirty-seven twenty-five. Maybe it's 47. Sometimes I write things down. Would you look up the verse about um, Jacob weeping? for uh, Joseph. So there is a verse. Do you have it? So there's a verse where Jacob had lost Joseph and Simon is gone. Deuteronomy? No. No, no. And so now they're asking... Pardon? Genesis? Yeah, it is. And so Jacob is mourning over the death of his son, Joseph, and his children are trying to get him to eat. And what his response is, is that I will not eat. I will go to the grave mourning for my lost child. This is the mourning, that the, the, the bitterness, the sorrow in giving birth to children that God is describing. Pain over untimely death. Pain of going to the grave, of the children going to the grave before the parents. Weeping bitterly at the spoiling of the children who lost their lives too early. The sorrow in bringing forth children, it's not just a physical pain of labor. It's the spiritual pain of watching your children be destroyed through domestic violence through mental illness, through drug abuse, through a lack of self-worth. How many children have killed themselves because they don't know that they're made in the image of God, that they're God's children, and that God loves them?
right? How many kids have been incarcerated? How many kids have been killed? And the parents' sorrow has been way worse than that of labor. These are the things that God was talking about. These are what the curse was, right? The, not labor pains, right? That physical reality tells the spiritual truth. This is the sorrow that comes from the knowledge of good and evil. We have desire and dominion. Ecclesiastes 5.8. Sometimes I write stuff down wrong. I'm not going to beat myself up for it. It might, it might have been, but we're past that point. Sorry. No, 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 love. I appreciate your hard work for me. You, you do always do a good job. Uh, normally, I double check all my scriptures. It, it happens. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.8 If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting judgment and justice in a providence, marvel not at the matter. Right? This is from the knowledge of good and evil. Right? The curse of the woman, which is the curse of all humanity, it's not just Eve, it's, it's all humans, is that you will have a desire and someone will have dominion over you. Right? And we see in the Bible that there's people who are doing injustices, the strong hurting the weak. Right? The knowledge of good and evil produces a system where the strong dominates the weak. And it produces a system where the weak seek protection from the strong. And this instantly creates a hierarchy system. It instantly creates a value system that relies on what you do, not who you are. This is very important. This is, comes from the knowledge of good and evil. Satan's system doesn't just say, what can you do? It says, what can you do better than others? This places a value on people that's not realistic. It's completely um, inappropriate, and it devastates people who realize that they don't have the intelligence. They don't have the physical strength. They don't have the capacity to live up to the world's standard. And this self-worth of the knowledge of good and evil devastates people and it destroys them this it's all because of the knowledge of good and evil right mankind is devastated physically emotionally psychologically and spiritually hear me out on this because when we don't believe we have god's love we work by the sweat of our brow to earn it let me say that again because when we believe that we have to earn God's love, we work by the sweat of our brow to earn it. Look at the 41,000 different Christian denominations, all trying to do everything that they can to earn God's love. It's impossible. Can't earn it. It's freely given. But when we believe we have to earn God's love, we work by the sweat of our brow to earn it. When we don't trust God to love and value us, we create our own value, and then we do things through accomplishments to make people love us. When we don't trust God to provide for us, we provide for ourselves. When we don't trust God to protect us, we protect ourselves. When we don't trust God to forgive us, when we don't trust God to forgive us of our sins, we harden our heart against him, then we formulate our own religions and make our own way to heaven. This is all the consequences of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan's system creates a mindset of not believing God, not trusting God, not having faith in God. And God predicted all of this in Genesis chapter 3 through the curses, which were in reality the consequences of, a, of the system that Adam and Eve chose, chose, which would wreak havoc throughout all human history. That's all it was. And the natural conclusion for anybody participating in this system is that you're going to become selfish, you're going to become self-preserving, even at the cost of taking others' lives. You're going to assert yourself above others so that you could have a greater value, so that you could have more love, even if it means you have to step on others to get to it. Satan's system of the knowledge of good and evil is a system of death because it makes life impossible. God did not call it the tree of death because he wanted us to understand the principles of that Satan was using to make death possible. Satan's system 
robs us of a knowledge of God's love. Satan's system robs us of our heritage as being made in the image of God. Satan's system robs us of our value as children of God. Satan's system of good and evil in this world is the source of competition, self-exaltation, pride, hatred, hypocrisy, corruption, injustice, condemnation, favoritism. Every single moral evil that is governs the minds of men it is from the knowledge of good and evil even if it seems good even if we think it's from God it's from Satan and I'm gonna say this this is gonna sound crazy but I don't think God ever intended for us to know good and evil I don't think God wanted us to know good I don't think God wanted us to know evil for as crazy as that sounds, I think God wanted us to know agape, right? Because the tree of life is agape. And no matter how good something seems, if it's not agape, it's not from God. God didn't want us to know any other goodness other than his agape goodness. No matter how good it seems, if it's not agape, it's not from God. And our minds need to be completely stripped from the knowledge of good and evil, in thought, in action, in deed, in motive, the character, the method, and the principles of the knowledge of good and evil have wrecked havoc on humanity. And Genesis chapter 3 proves that God predicted what it would do to humanity. We need to be transformed in our mind by agape so that every thought, every action, every word, every deed, every motive is God's goodness. It's God's agape, not Satan's goodness, not Satan's version, twist of what goodness is. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this. I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Bible is calling us to have a transformed mind. God wants to take us from the knowledge of good and evil, principle character method to the mind of agape in principle character and method second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 second corinthians second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are those imaginations and highly exalted things that oppose themselves to the knowledge of God? That's Satan's system, the knowledge of good and evil. This removes God's love from my mind. This strips away my heritage. It strips away my value. It strips away why God created me and it replaces with a counterfeit system, a hierarchy that causes me to earn love, to earn value. And if you're in my way, I'll, uh, I'll do whatever it takes to get you out of there. It's very important. Very important to understand that when Satan removes God's love, when he removes our heritage, when he removes our value as God's children, he replaces it with a satanic counterfeit. And these ideas, these need to come down, these strongholds need to come down and it says that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're strong and mighty in God. Let's look at these weapons. John chapter 8 verse 31. These are, these are our weapons of warfare. John chapter 8 verse 31 says this. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, 
If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's the first weapon, is that the truth sets us free from the lies of Satan. God does love you. You are made in his image. You are his child. Once you believe that, that is the that is the tearing down of the strongholds that kept you as enemies and slaves to God. 2 Peter 1.4 2 Peter, there we go, 2 Peter 1, 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What is the corruption that is in the world? That's the knowledge of good and evil. How do we escape that? Through the promises of God. The truth sets us free from the snares and lies of Satan, and the promises of God restore the divine nature of agape in us. These are the weapons of our warfare, the truth about who God is as our Father, right? That He loves me, and that He is not personally offended by my sin and he considers me more important than he considers himself not just me everybody in the world the truth about God sets me free right from the entire satanic system of good and evil and the promises of God when we believe them this restores the divine character back into me which the knowledge of good and evil robbed me from and my character grows back into the divine image of agape. And if you look in the Bible, agape is compared to a plant that grows in us. It says first the blade, then the ear, then the stalk, then the fruit. It compares this growth of agape in us to a plant. Because just like as a plant is alive, agape is alive. Agape is the living law of life. It's what makes life possible and it's alive. This is why you could not kill Jesus at the cross because you can't kill agape. It's alive. right? Satan tried to destroy the life of agape in us at the, knowledge, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God can restore the life of agape back into us if we simply believe his truth and cling to his promises. The divine character will be restored. Understanding the knowledge of good and evil in these earth's final moments is just as important as any end time message, especially for the character of God movement. There's a movement in the world that reveals the truth about who God really is through the life of Christ. The knowledge of good and evil is just as important to this end time movement than any other biblical principle. Because, check this out, Christianity focused so much on Satan's evil side that it is almost completely ignorant and vulnerable and doesn't understand Satan's good side. I'm not saying Satan is good. Satan's good is evil. It's a counterfeit goodness. But Christianity focuses so much on the evil side. When Satan presents something good, we think it's from God. Understanding the knowledge of the tree of good and evil is just as important as any end time message, especially for the character of God movement. Right? The only way that we can see evil in Satan's goodness is to understand what true goodness looks like. True goodness is agape. True goodness is Jesus. True goodness is the character, the method, and the principles of the Father. When you know and understand what agape, the Father, Jesus looks like in character, method, and principle, Satan's goodness can no longer deceive you because you see what it really is, evil. 
And when somebody says something that sounds really good, and yet there's force, manipulation, coercion in it, when there's self-exaltation in it, when there's any kind of slave-master relationship in it, when there's any kind of violence in it, verbal, physical, mental, emotional, psychological, you can see through Satan's lies and say that's the knowledge of the tree of good and evil that that preacher is teaching. Be careful. Don't eat that fruit, because that fruit will only reproduce kind after itself. Very important. The end time message being carried by people, agape, design law, the two trees, right? Agape is not just information. This is an action principle that needs to be displayed in the life, right? If I just go around telling people about agape, that's just giving them information. I need to live agape. I need to receive the spirit of agape so that I can share agape, so that I can give people hope that God can change people's lives through agape. It's not an information transfer. It's a giving of life, the same way that Jesus did. Very important. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil is just as important as any end-time information, especially for the character of God movement. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings of the Spirit. We thank you that you pour into us, Lord, not because we earned it, not because we deserve it, but because your grace is real for anybody. Anybody can receive your spirit as a river. If we simply go to you and ask, we can freely receive. Lord, help us to understand these principles of agape, design law, and the two trees. Shape our minds, remake us in the image of God so that we may go about loving people then preaching truth to them. Help us, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all.